For me, from my you princess, you has been entertaining audiences with a unique Joey style Coco Diaz has of been rocking humor since the 90s, all right? With her tongue-in-cheek, she's been exploring such topics of the dynamics of the male-female relationships, or as we call them here in the studio, dirty thoughts, and the proliferation of the 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 Greetings, you little podcasters <laughs> out there in podcast land. You got Beauty and the Beast, Felicia Michaels. Joey Diaz. What's happened, you sexy animal? Oh, my God. I've just had a crazy week. You look beautiful, I must tell you. Let's, let's start off the podcast with that. You look fucking you beautiful You are just the usual. best. You your are the best. Your little Venice Beach shirt on. You're looking perky today, you know what I'm saying? Um, you got your little 14-year-old training bra on your back. I put my bra on this morning. Shit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're fucking ready to go, Jack. Well, thank you, Joey. You still got it, Felicia. I'm telling you. Oh, you're very One sweet. way or another, I'm going to get a hold of Hef and say, Hef, you got to take a look at Felicia 20 years later. See if you're missing, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He should do a section on women 20 years later. I Just, bet he does. He does, or he, he does. and we got to get you back on. Yeah. And I tell you, this is a friend. I'm not telling you this because I want to lick your asshole or I want people to say, oh, he's so nice to No, seriously, you have a lot still going So you're for saying you. you don't want to lick my ass? No, you know, if the situation was right, <laughs> if you were flying through the air and you were naked and your ass was pointed at my face. You might stick your tongue out. It's like a Reese's peanut butter cup. Chocolate meets fucking peanut butter. Oh, yeah. you know <laughs> it happens every once in a while. Yeah, what happened? I don't know. My tongue ended up in your asshole. How'd that happen? Oh, wow. Jesus, what a way to start a podcast. That's better so, than a cup of coffee. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, I got to leave next week, you know, for a couple of days, so we were just talking outside that we're going to do our thing this week, and it's going to be money for you guys because we don't have that much time. It's just busy. Yeah, it's, it's starting been really to get busy. busy. You just came back from San Francisco. I did a one-nighter at Mark Pitta's. Uh, he has a theater show uh, at the Throckmorton Theater in Mill Valley, and I went, and it was fantastic. If you live in San Francisco, he does this show every Tuesday, and Robin Williams drops in, Damon Carvey drops in because they lo- all live in that area, Mort Saul. Uh, a lot of the old guys, and uh, and it was a great show. I had to follow a juggler. He was really funny, and uh, and uh, I was a little nervous, you know, because I was the last one going on, And uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was, it was a great gig, great gig. I'm trying to get you on that gig. See, Felicia Michaels getting out there, trying to. shaking that ass, cracking jokes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I don't really shake my ass. I shuffle to the microphone. Yeah, but it's just been busy, so talk about my pussy. we had a hit. And one thing I do want to give a mention to is, we got a lot of great emails this week. Oh, my God, I mean, Joe, we got a yeah. lot of great emails. Yeah. And I'm not going to mention any names, Felicia. I do have to give a few shots out. But for starters, I want to talk about the email. Uh, a lot of people have watched the Rogan podcast. And the beginning of the podcast started out with uh, Red Band asking me what the podcast was about. You know, uh-huh. And I was like, what the fuck? You know, I don't know what the podcast is about. The podcast is about us. It's basically about our lives and how we learned and how we went along and what we learned from our regrets and shit like that. That's what the podcast is about. And right. In, in there, there's funny stories and there's humor and we find it and we don't, we, we do push the envelope. Who the hell are we kidding? But I want to tell you something. This show is becoming, you know, a, a show representing of the emails we get from people. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. And, I, and I got a great couple emails this week about people who are underdogs and felt like underdogs. And yes, we are underdogs, you know. We are definitely underdogs. You know, underdogs. we still drink Rango like John Gotti. Fucking Rango when he was making 12 million a year. <laughs> right. Because it was the underdog. And I, I love those emails. I like the emails. Listen, uh, I'm not rich. I don't have any money in the bank. You know, I got I got my SAG, uh, uh, whatever the fuck it is, pension, you know. And, and, I, and I tell you, to see where I've been and where I am now, I'm happy with that SAG pension. But nothing measures up to me, Felicia, than when I get an email that says that by listening to our podcast, it made them realize their dreams. Right. That makes my dick hard. I'm right. telling you in a, in a weird way. No, it's it's very nice because uh, when you say when you said that, that Redman was saying, uh, what is the podcast about? And I've said this before. The podcast is about uh, people who live uh, within the fabric of a legitimate society but got there through an illegitimate means and are now a working part of society and are proud of themselves and proud of their adventure. And to me, that's what the podcast is about. And I, and I love talking about uh, the music we talk about. I love when you uh, tell your stories. I know you're always like, come up with a fucking story, Felicia, <laughs> cocksucker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the truth is, you are the master storyteller. And, uh, and I love uh, the emails we've been getting. 
and uh, and I've learned so much from our friendship, you know, and uh, and I'm really digging how this is going. When we first started talking about doing the podcast, we were like, you got to listen to this podcast and this podcast and all this, and I was kind of lazy, and I was kind of afraid to because I really am at this point in my life where I don't want to overthink shit. I just want to do and then think about what that represents. You know, like in early in my career, I used to think, if I did this, I'm going to get this. And if I did this, I'm going to get this. And what does this mean? And all then all you end up doing is becoming this angry, weird little person. Slave for it's yourself. A slave it's a weird thing. Yeah, towards yeah. your insecurities. And and I, I'm trying to live my life now where it's just like uh, – I, I want to have uh, an adventure. I want to take the blindfold off. I don't want to think about the forest. I just want to enjoy the trees. You know what I mean? Like uh, my big argument all the time to people who frustrate me is stop looking at the trees and, and look at the whole thing, the forest. But for me, it's the opposite because I spend all my time just thinking about the forest when I should be enjoying the trees. You know what I mean? Like that's the perfect balance uh, in, in my life. And, uh, and to get people's emails and say, you know, this happened to me and I had a fucked up thing go down like this. Like we got an email from a young man uh, uh, who always wanted to join Be the a army. Soldier. Yeah, Be yeah. a soldier. He lived his life towards that direction. And uh, and then when he uh, then was a soldier, he was so overwhelmed by it. It's tough. You know, my brother, who uh, was an amazing person in his own way, he had a sad life as he got older, but he wanted that too. And he actually joined the army and got kicked out because he just was a person that couldn't deal and uh, a similar thing happened with this listener where where it kind of freaked them out and then they got a discharge in, in some sense it's not an honorable it was no, he like got, he, he, he tapped out on, on his own right. once he got in and he was overwhelmed he, he was, was too young for the experience yeah and he went out and he, he took a look at from you know inside and he said he goes my brothers are gone i cried on the train and uh it was fucking mind-boggling when i read that when i first read it was at night and i just tucked it away uh-huh. And I said, I'll look at it in a couple of days, you know, when I'm mentally prepared for this. And once I read the whole thing, I got to tell you, I was crying. Yeah. And, uh, and there was like two emails that made me fucking cry this Yeah. Week. In fact, we're going to have you read that email in just Absolutely. a bit. And, uh, and we're not going to name names because that's not what this is about. Uh, this is about uh, sharing your experience and saying, hey, you know, a journey just isn't constantly climbing up a mountain. A journey is, is uh, you know, seeking the little valleys in between each peak and uh, and understanding when you get to the next peak uh, how you should be proud of yourself you absolutely know, and look it's back a, at your lessons it's weird that the last couple of weeks I've been getting emails from younger guys <coughs> 21 19 23 with drug addictions or they don't know and you know I talk a lot of shit on this podcast I talk about robbing shit you know when after 19 I really became a little fucking vagrant once I moved to Colorado Right. But what a lot of people don't know is that whole time I was in Colorado burglarizing houses, I was taking classes at night at a college. Right. <laughs> is that the weirdest fucking thing? I never told nobody this. My, my, my whole thing in life was at that time was doing blow and trying to get knowledge. And even when I was living in Jersey, in North Bergen, I was borrowing money from loan sharks and hanging out in Joe and Mary's. I was always taking a plumbing course at Tito Berra High or something. Right. I was always one of those morons that took a course at night. I always believed in that. And it kept me kind of weird. A lot of people say to me, dog, how did you keep through all that? That was my thing. You know, I have friends that are killers, and I have friends like Jerry Roker that are fucking nerds, and I'm proud of them. Oh, I like hanging out yeah. with nerds. I yeah. like hanging out with people that have breath of fresh air to me. But one thing I tell these young guys when they email me, you know, listen, hang in there. If you have a problem, so the fuck what? Everybody does. You're Everybody alive, does. motherfucker, yeah. and you're 23. Step back. Listen, maybe you're not ready to quit. I, I wasn't ready to quit either. The only reason why I quit was because they put me behind bars. Maybe that's what it, it takes. All we want you to do is become productive members of society. Do you want to get high three nights a week? Do you want to take three nights of classes? Be my, you want to learn about George Washington, but at the same time, snort up Pablo Escobar? Get Learn the fucking globe. Right. Do what the fuck you do, but keep existing. You know, it got to the point where I remember at one time, I got a letter from the University of Colorado in Boulder saying, hey, you can't even come to night classes here no more. You have too many credits. It's time for you to transfer to the big college. And I'm like, are you fucking guys serious? And here I am, burglarizing, walking around with my eyes open on this campus, but I was in college. Right. I, and I was 25, but I was in college. Right. You know? So please, if you're young, get involved with something. Get involved with something completely opposite of what you're doing. You're into heroin? Fuck it. Be into heroin. But three nights a week, go take a baking course. You know what I'm saying? Go learn how to fucking be a baker or something. Stay alive. 
Right. That's all we're trying to tell you kids to stay alive. And that's what kept me straight was all those little dumb things I used to do. I was always involved in night classes. Right. I love knowledge, man. Well, I'm, I'm going to say that if you are on heroin, we I hope the best for you. And uh, It's an expression, guys. No, I, I know, didn't mean but heroin. Please I see, could mean yeah, weed. But please seek help. Or, but, here, <coughs> but, but in the same vein of what you're saying, I totally understand that because when I remember when I was 18, 19 and I was stripping and I was just telling the activity partner some really crazy stories and, uh, and I remember uh, I didn't drink. I didn't drink or do drugs the whole time I stripped because I was like, man, I'm... If I drink or if I smoke pot or if I do coke or shoot up or anything, it's going to go down in fucking flames. I'm already on the edge of damaging myself. You know what I mean? I, I thankfully was didn't, you know what I mean? But I saw a lot of people that did. But I knew if I fucking have one drink, it's fucking over, you know? And then sitting next to strippers drinking and doing coke and seeing their disaster was, you know what I mean? It was also like, oh, shit. I it's amazing not. when you know you're living. And you know yes, what's really going to Because open people you up. do know their limits. Some people have, like, you had, your limit was uh, way different than, obviously, than my limit. But you got to that point where you understood your limit, right? Absolutely. Three years ago, right before I quit cocaine, right before I, I quit November, in June, I got reattached with a buddy of mine that was crazy as a kid. His name was Bonehead crazy he was a couple years older than me. he was a plumber and we were kids you know we go into the city with him like i drive because he didn't have a license he lost in a dui right. and he'd give me 50 dollars, take me to mcsorley's ale house buy me lunch and then give me like four valiums and he'd show me all the copping spots and shit he was a pro he was a heroin kid right. but not with me it was really weird not around me and uh one night he uh he called me after 20 years out of the blue I, i'm friends with his brothers and he goes, I'm back in Jersey, and he's telling me about his plight, and his wife had just killed herself oh. over the holidays, oh. and, and he was really hurting, and he called me to talk to me, all oh, the movies, this, I'm so proud, and we're talking, and he goes, Cokes, do you, do you, he goes, remember when we did heroin that time, and I'm like, I don't remember that when you go, it's back, he goes, I went down to Newark, and it's all over Newark, it's seven dollar bags, as a joke, I said to him, Bonehead, send me some. Oh, no. Just to see if he would, you know what right. I'm saying? Oh. Three days later, shut up. There's Joey Diaz. Joey spelt wrong, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joey spelt wrong like a motherfucker. I take it upstairs. I open up three little packages fall out. Oh. He sent it like in the mail, wrapped in like a letter that said, you know, I love you. I'm like, what if the cops were open this? Oh. So every Monday, like my big coke night was Mondays. I don't know why. I would go out every Monday to Laugh Factory or something. And I would go home, and I would in, in June and July. I remember I did the heroin two Mondays in a row. Oh, you oh like yeah. Little like a half. You of didn't a shoot se- it. You just no no no. I don't it, see right? needles. Yeah. I did like a half of a seven dollar oh, yeah, bag. Can, you can't shoot no, it. No, I can't <laughs> shoot. So I did right. like a half of a seven dollar bag, and I was blown the fuck away. Uh, I didn't puke either. I just did it and just sat in the living room. And Terry kept asking me what the problem was. I'm like nothing. You know there ain't no problems. Yeah. And she passed out. I stayed up for two or three hours more fucked up fucked up smoking some dope and realizing why do I even do coke yeah. I put the rest of the two and a half packages away the next Monday I did the other half wow. and that's when I realized that morning when I woke up is when I said why do I do coke this is the shit oh, and then no. I didn't do it for two or three weeks and then I did a whole seven dollar bag and that was just a little too much that was like an eight hour ride of hell but it was brilliant I puked oh, I did everything no. I got high Joey. but that next morning, I threw away the last $7 thing, and I said, I'll never do coke again. And after that, I probably did coke three times, and the shit went down with the cat. Yeah. And I swore that the cat would live, and well, boom, I never did limit. coke again. Yeah. That was my limit. It was it's really weird. So I did heroin to get yeah. off the coke to open the gateway to see it from a different angle. That's a right. fucked up story. You know? Yeah. It's amazing what, how sometimes you have to... Uh, yeah. Do one thing to do the other. You yeah. Know? It's just like the podcast. Like we talk, there's the stuff we cut out where you kind of have to have a shitty conversation to get to the good part, you know? Oh, yeah, sometimes. And, you and know uh, uh, people just shouldn't hear it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> one time we were kids at Bonehead Di Lorenzo. His brother was the guy I sold the 30 engagement rings to that time. Oh, when His you, brother when was you snatched fence. from that jewelry, yeah, from the jewelry store? store? Okay. His brother was the fence on it. And we were friends. I would go to their house. There were three boys. I could walk in their house and make an egg cream, and the mother would feed me, and the father right. was a longshoreman, and they had a buddy who was a Westie, 
were the Irish mobsters, and he always had jobs for me. Like, Joey, I got a job for you in a warehouse. $10 an hour for three weeks. I want you to watch the safe. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was fucking great. This guy was great. Tommy was his name. I really loved him. No offense, Joey, but I would never want you to watch my safe. No, it was hysterical. And I remember, no, like, watch the safe, like the activity. He would get me jobs at, like, Joe's Shoe Warehouse. He knew the supervisor, and they were going to rob the joint. So he just wanted me to double check what the movements were as a thief, oh. like what the, to case the joint. Oh. So for three weeks, the supervisor would give me 12 an hour. I'd get there like at 10, and I'd sweep and load boxes, but I'd see the activity oh. when they'd make deposits, shit like right. that, and I'd tell them. That was Tommy, oh. you know what I'm saying? So I would go to their house, and they always had different assignments for me. Right. In fact, even, <laughs> they always were great. Those type they A were, families. I remember one time I was in Colorado, and I called them Tommy. I go, Tommy, I got an ingrown toenail. He goes, I had one of those in the can one time. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, take a fucking screwdriver and pop it out. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh but the my funny God. thing about Tommy oh was, yeah, 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 oh, shit, we used to rock. This is, this is pre-Colorado. It was last year before I went to Colorado. I had gone to Colorado, and then went back to Jersey, and I had it together. So people started giving me a little bit more love. I wasn't uh, as much of a fucking Irakawa as a crazy Indian anymore. I was a little bit more settled. I had this little girlfriend everybody knew. We were in love. I, I was still crazy, but I was a little contained. So Tommy Kenny was my fucking guy that would blast me little jobs and shit and post me on little things. Uh -huh. So I would go to his house, the D's house, Bonehead's house. And every night we'd go over there and hang out. And I liked the younger brother was my goomba. And in the middle, the older brother was my goomba, who was bonehead. Right. But the middle brother thought he was Johnny Bananas. Even okay. at an early age, he thought, you know, he had an Avante. Who the fuck has an Avante <laughs> car? Exactly. Right, right. He had an Avante, which is an Italian piece of shit car. It oh, always blew up. God. But, you know, he always had black tie occasions and would always, like, shun us. when we Because he was, like, five years old. And now you can't yeah. hang out with us. Yeah, fuck yeah. you, punk. But this guy was in, in some deep shit. And I didn't know he had that deep shit in the house. So one night, I got a knock on my window, like 3 a.m., and it's the moron, the one who thinks he's Johnny Bananas. Right. He's like, can I talk to you for a second? He goes, come on, let's go over to my house. So we drive back to my house. Everybody's awake in his house. This was a fun family in the neighborhood. They were a lot. Of, I'm still friends with that. Right. I, you know, we don't talk because we had a little disagreement. But uh, him and I, he sits me down. He goes, listen, you were here tonight. I go, yeah. He goes, I'm missing $40,000 and $100,000 worth of jewelry. He goes, Coach, you were here, bro. I go, Emil, or whatever your fucking name is, if I was here and took the jewelry, do you think I would be at home sleeping at 3 in the morning? He goes, I know you, man. You took it, you took it, you took it. We sat there for an hour. Going back. The father woke up. He's like, I don't think he took it. The mother came up, and she's like, you're crazy. He's family. How dare you insult him and tell him this shit? And Chris is like, bro, he was here. The other brother got up, and he was like, I don't think Coco did it. This went on for two, three Were hours. Were you scared? I was a little scared, but yeah. I, I didn't take it. I didn't take it, you know? Because uh, when the whole family is arguing, yeah, we're they're arguing ready to back take and it. forth. That's pretty scary. So they cook breakfast and we go, fuck it, you know, we'll find it. It's some. Then they realized Bonehead had come in, in the middle of the night. They said, were you here at two? And I go, no. And they go, somebody came in at two. And they're like, Bonehead did it. <laughs> so sure enough, the next morning I go back over there and I'm like, what happened last night? They're like, you don't even want to fucking know. Bonehead went into the city. He went to take the $40 out, uh -huh. but he couldn't fidget the, the lock, so he took the whole fucking tackle box with 40000 and 100000 worth of jewelry into the city, into Brooklyn, parked the car. Didn't want to leave the tackle box in the fucking car. He took the tackle box out with the jewelry and the cash, put it in the garbage can, put a lid on it, went upstairs, shot heroin. When he came down, the garbage people came and oh. took the hundred, the tw forty grand and the 100 in jewelry. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, fucking yeah. This was a crazy house. This was one of the craziest Italian houses I ever hung out at. So what happened? He told him the truth. It wasn't Coco. It was me. So this is what he did. Six months later, I would sleep there some nights. This is how tight I was with this family. I would go over there at three and eat right out of the refrigerator. Right. They would be out cold. Yeah. This is how much they loved me and I loved them. I would take their food, eat, and go on the couch and watch TV. Bonehead, what I forgot to tell you people, was one of the best Italian men you ever, best looking men you ever seen in your oh, life. Really? Even with his H problem, yeah. when this skinny motherfucker, well, he looked like De Niro in Godfather 2, oh, only put really? six foot two on it and thin and black jet hair. Wow. When, and I remember walking into clubs with him and hearing women say shit to him, but he was so na naive and quiet and shy, he wouldn't fuck him. But his girlfriend in real life, Donna, half Irish, half Chinese, 
You better oh. check yourself before you wreck yourself. Back in the eighties, she was throwing heat. She was like five foot nine, one of those yeah. Bruce Lee sisters, motherfuckers. I remember they would get fucking high on heroin, and they would both fall asleep naked, and she would fall asleep with that monkey out with that leg open. I'd be over there cooking breakfast, looking at her little pussy and shit. It was crazy. Oh my god! One <laughs> night, this <laughs> one, and I the father would wake up and he'd go, "Coco, go throw a blanket on that fucking spider." <laughs> <laughs> Coco, we'll throw a blanket on that spider. Look at it. That thing's seen more action than the Lincoln Tunnel. The best thing that ever was one night, Bonehead came home. Uh, I, I get there and the, the fucking, there's a fire. There's a fucking fire at the De Lorenzo house. Fucking flames and fire departments out there. The grandma's outside. So after they realized what happened, uh, they fucking... They made a hole in the ceiling to let the heat out of the house. Right. And they're all outside. They're like, somebody's missing. Bonehead. The heroin dealer. So they run in the fucking house. This is after the fire department's been there for right. an hour knocking down doors. Yeah. Bonehead's on the couch, passed out. <laughs> and, and what happened was he was cooking french fries and those oil things. You oh, know, when you put no. in the thing, it was an oil fire. He slept right through it. And when they woke him up, he'd be like, get off me. What, are my fries ready? That's what oh, he told I no. swear to God. Oh, to this day, no. whenever I see the dad, I go, Oh, my fries ready. Go fuck yourself, <laughs> you miserable spick bastard. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Those are two fucking stories right I there. I know, Joe. You like that shit. I love that and I still And I'm still tight with them. The one brother, the junkie died. God bless his soul. He was my brother. Bonehead died he about died. Oh. a year and a half ago. A heroin in Miami. And then the brother in Miami is fucked up. He did so many steroids, he's got to wear slippers. Because his arthritis, his feet get like oh, Fred Flintstone. Really? It's hysterical. Yeah. There's days he can't leave the house because oh. his feet. And the older brother, the one I didn't get along with that accused me of that shit, right. I'm going to be as honest as I can with you. Let me tell you how I turned this around. I tortured him for life after that. He would always say, hey, you want to go to a movie? What? You want to go to a movie with a guy who robbed you? Jesus fucking Christ. You right. gotta <laughs> so I'd say, give me 50 bucks. I won't talk about it no more. This went on for 20 years. Right. It went up to 1,000, 1,500. Right, right. I would call him up and say, you don't want to feel guilty anymore? Put fifteen hundred Western <laughs> Union, and he would do it. This oh, is, he would. Oh, this is oh, my dog. Wow. I torture him. I, when right. I go, listen. When I go back to Jersey, I would. He would pick me up at the airport, complain the whole way. How I was a spick fuck, and I was no good. And you know, now I got to sleep at his house. What was he? A fucking uh, a slumber party, and he's got to right. pay for me. He would. When I get home, my room would be vacuumed. He loved when I went down there. The family, yeah. the mother. One of the last times I went there was about four years ago, and they do coke, heavy coke. The, the, the brother now with his girlfriend. I would not do it because they drive you crazy. He talks. He's one of those guys that picks your lock that talks to you. Right. Like you're sleeping and all of a sudden he'll wake you up and sit next to you and shit. Yeah, no, no. Oh yeah. Listen, he would wake his father up at night. Dad, let's oh, talk about man. the Kennedy assassination. Get the fuck out of my room. <laughs> you're doing that white lightning again, you cocksucker. <laughs> Drop some knowledge on him about our new sponsor. Oh, our new sponsor, by the way, is Adam and Eve. You can go to adamandeve.com and make a selection of any kind of sexual toy, any kind of sexual product, or if you just want to, you know, look at nipple chains or whatever you want to do. But if you should choose to purchase something, if you go to the promotional code, by the way, free shipping if you do it through Beauty and the Beast. But when you go to the promotional box, you put in the name Felicia, F-E-L-I-C-I-A, and you will get 50% off. Free shipping and a sensual gift. And three videos. Three videos. And not those Hong Kong Fui ones. Real Hong ones. Hong Kong Fui. <laughs> that you see the head, you see the feet, you see the little monkey, you see it all. You know what I'm saying? Hong Kong Don't get confused. Fui. This is Adam and Eve. They don't deal in that third world pirate shit. You know what I'm saying? Felicia, <laughs> <laughs> I have a fan in my heart. Listen, I'm no big shot, but I have one fucking fan. I really have it's one fan, and you he's in Florida, years. and he's in Miami, and he's my brother, Dougie Knuckles, him and this Tom Wagner guy. They'll go to war with me. Like, if I call Dougie Knuckles and say, Dougie, I got 20 fucking Puerto Ricans outside with knives, and it's me and you against the world. Dougie Knuckles will take a flight up here on Southwest and help me out. I know that. I right. know from seeing him. You know, it's just crazy, and he's my real true fan. Like, he's a fan. Right. Like, he'll live and die with me. You know what I'm saying? He's doing comedy down there in South Florida. And it was his birthday, and I really want to give him a shout oh, out because he's a good Happy man. Happy birthday, Doug Dougie Knuckles. Dougie Knuckles, I want to give my man Darren Broadfoot a fucking shout out from Twitter. 
He's a good man. I want to give my man Bowie a shout out because he told us a tremendous story. And, uh, yes, yeah. We'll there's, run with there's been a lot of great stories. And I love all you guys. I really do. You guys make my fucking day. The other day, we were talking about a book that I read. I went to the downtown library and I read a book. And it's been bothering me since I read the book. And I've been making calls about it because it's a book called The Pleasant Avenue Connection. Right. <coughs> about heroin in the uh, 50s and 60s in New York. And this Jew sold it out of the stage deli. And it's really interesting. But they talked about the runners in those days were Cubans. Uh-huh. And I remember that I heard all these stories from my mom would tell me about my dad. And then as I got older, I heard and then I read this book the other day, and I and I read names that they would talk about. Right. And it really fucked me up. Like, what, uh, the French Connection was a friend of my mom's. His name was Louis the Turkey. Louis really? Fowle in Spanish. He was a Cuban guy. And he was one of the guys that was going to France and stuff. And when they made that movie, I remember, like, my family was up in arms. They're like, they're making a movie. They lied about it. The guy's a Spanish guy. Like, they were all pissed off. They're saying he's French. It's a fucking lie. So it should have been the Spanish connection. It should have been the Spanish connection. But they, well, it was coming from France, uh-huh. you know, in cars. Oh, okay. That's how he was doing it. He was moving from France in cars. But it, was, it wasn't in the movie. They showed, like, a French guy. But it was really a Cuban guy called Louis the Turkey. And I called my friend in Miami. He goes, oh, the guy's still alive. He's really? like 85, he lives in the Keys, he's rich, you know, he has an island, you know. So why did they call him Louis the Turkey? That was just a name, Louis yeah. Fowl, you know, that was just a street name. Because isn't it him. like if your street name is sillier, that means you're more dangerous? I don't know, maybe he ate turkey every fucking day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Maybe he had... Maybe he broke tur- necks like turkey necks Yeah, maybe he liked, uh, what's the pill in turkey? What's that shit that makes you sleep? Uh, melatonin. Tryptophan? Yeah, whatever the fuck. Maybe yeah. he was a little addicted to tryptophan. I don't know, what he bothered me for with these questions? Because <laughs> I have questions. Questions. <laughs> Questions. But it was just weird that, you know, when I was a kid, I would get high. Like, I would smoke dope, and I would drink Boone's Farm. You know, like you go through the levels of getting high, and then you start drinking beer, and then you, somebody robs a bottle, and somebody gets sick, and then you evolve. And for a long time, like, I was stuck in this limbo. I would just smoke pot and drink, and my friends were snorting that THC crystal. Wow. And I remember that. I, w- I wrote about that, how when I first did the crystal, like, it broke my heart for a month. Because it wasn't that I, it was that I put some in my nose. Like, that was, like, the thing I was most against ever, you know? Like, really? Oh, my God, I really? hate it. Yeah, I hated it, hated it. People who put shit in their nose, like drugs or something. So when I did it, it was so hard for me. Like, it fucking set me back 20 years. And then I just kept doing it. It's like being fat. You know, you go to the gym, you do 10 push-ups, nothing works, and you just keep fucking eating, you know? Right. And that's what I think part of it was. But it's so weird how when I read that, like, I was so against all that shit. Like, my dad had died from snorting heroin. And I found that on the slide. Like, I, I, I found all the death certificates and shit. Oh, yeah. And they fixed them. They said he died of a heart attack. But then it was weird because after he died, like years later, when I went to get the prudential and insurance paperwork, they didn't sign his death certificate. And that was why. It was like an inside job. They buried him and they sent him to Cuba. Like, he's buried in Cuba. Oh, right he there. is? Yeah, my mom sent him back to Cuba in 66. She really? took him all the way to Mexico. And in Mexico, she said, See, I got a warrant in Cuba. I can't go back there. Wow. So they followed the body all the way to Mexico. Then they shipped him. That's crazy. I didn't... Wow. Yeah, my yeah. dad's buried in Cuba. They shipped him back. My mom was like, fuck it. I sent him back. Now, have you ever been back to Cuba no, since No, no, I won't go back. Boy? I'm, I'm kind of scared. Why? Just, uh, I might stay. Yeah. I would stay. You really? Know? I, at this point in the fucking game, I like that chitter-chatter in Spanish, and I could go for that again, I think, you know? Yeah. There's times I see it, and it's pretty... Uh, it's my roots. It really is yeah. my roots. It's like anything else. But it would be too deep for me. My sister's in Cuba. You know, I have a sister yeah. that I've never really met, you know. So she's in Cuba. I haven't talked to her in 30 years, you know. My grandmother died. I got a, But all my relatives in Cuba, like big time, like they're my one uncle. I have four uncles left. One is the, in charge of the Department of Agriculture, and the other ones are musicians. They're all big musicians that travel with the Cuban band oh, all really? around the world. And they come oh, yeah. here and stuff. They were here last year. But Did I was out of town. It? No, I was oh. out of town, but they left their music and shit. It's like rock music mixed with Spanish, and it's, it's fucking weird. That's why my uncle always says, I cannot figure out how you became a comedian because there's so much music in your family. They were all musicians, you know? Right. Especially my uncle. My uncle was a musician. He was an Earth the Kids band. They opened for the Stones and everything. Oh, really? Fuck yeah. My oh, uncle's really? got the pictures of him and Mick Jagger and all that. Him, and, him at the forum with Abdul Jabbar, and he always says, those fucking black guys smoked a lot of weed those oh, days. Sure. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and those guys. But it's just really interesting that where you come from. I meet my uncle once a week or I try. And every time I see him, he laughs. He's like, God damn it, you remind me so much of my dad. 
Oh, really? Yeah, so it's weird. Like, he goes, you talk like him, you walk like him. And I yeah. asked him, what my dad, what did my grandpa do? He goes, your dad, well, your grandpa was in charge of buying and selling shit. Like, he'd buy a TV, fix it, and sell it for like eight bucks more. But he would hit jackpots every day. Yeah. You know, it's pretty weird to realize where you come from. You know, a lot of people well, don't know. I just went to a family reunion in Kansas. And <coughs> so it is a freaky thing to look at all your relatives that are some physical variation of yourself. And, and you know what I mean? Like, wow, that's what I would look like if I never put a cookie down. That's what I would look like if I was a closeted gay man and I joined the military. That's what I would look like. You know what I mean? It's if I was a child molester in a wheelchair. You know what I mean? Like, that is, it's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Have you ever got like beat up by the cops? Yeah. Like tell tell me the worst time you ever got the shit beat out of you by the cops. I was just telling the story the other day because I, I, I was telling a buddy of mine that you know I don't like fighting because if you ever get your nose broken it fucking hurts. You know I got my nose broken thirty years ago. This motherfucker still hurts. I didn't feel really? it. For, yeah, I didn't feel it for all those years because I was doing blow. Right. Once I stopped doing blow, I realized like, my, my nose. fucking nose hurts like a motherfucker. Still, to this day, I wake up sometimes and my nose hurts. One time my buddy broke it in a fist fight. Another time I broke it playing basketball. But one of the weirdest times I broke it was at the John Matlack. Uh, the Mets were playing our high school teachers in a basketball faculty game. I was maybe like in uh, ninth grade or something, and a fight broke out. A big fight broke out. I mean, this is the Mets playing against my high school team, and a fucking fight breaks out. Right. And they're punching the baseball players in the Mets. It was classic. And the cops jumped in, and one of the cops hit me in the face with a, a police stick. A baton? A baton. It yeah. got me right in the fucking nose. And it was the worst pain I ever had in my life. I mean, it was horrible. And I ended up knowing the cop, you know? And it was yeah. weird. Like, days later, he had apologized, but it was like a weird hit. He turned around into me. He was just trying to hit people. Right. But that's the extent of my being beat up by a cop. I seen a good fight one night in the village with my buddy Mark D'Onofrio, who played for the Penn State, and then he went to Green Bay. We were in the city at a, at a diner, eating not a diner, but at a rest at a, 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 a grocery store that has right. food at right. four in the morning. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we were online, and some guys came in. And one thing led to another. And fucking Mark D'Onofrio hit this guy in the face with a chicken cutlet sandwich. It was fucking really? classic. Really? Just smacked him in the face. And the bread fell off and then the chicken cutlet fell off. <laughs> and then the guy takes his badge out. He had a badge underneath on a chain. He goes, undercover cops. So it went on. Mark D'Onofrio started hitting him. Now, I didn't get hit. I didn't throw a punch. I was more frozen than anything. This is 94. So okay. oh, really? <laughs> Mark's got a limo. Yeah. So we all get in the limo and we go over to the bridge. And as we're going to the bridge, we get pulled over by the cops. And they said, it's six of you, so we got to take two of you to jail. So I had, like, an outstanding warrant, so they took me for damn sure, and they took Mark, and they took us to the tombs. The tombs in New York is the real deal of jails. It's a 24-7 fucking jail. You've never seen nothing like that. You come in, you get arranged, you get arraigned, you go in front of a judge. It could be four in the morning. You're in front of a judge, there's a bail bondsman, and there's action. It's action. Yeah. What'd you do? 500, come back on the 28th with 300. And they held us for the weekend because I had a, 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 a whatever, and they held him for something. You had a what? A warrant okay. for some <laughs> shit. Like a, a warrant in a, I had a warrant in Hackensack, New Jersey for a check from the 80s or some shit. And uh, <laughs> I was working at Boulevard Hardware, and we robbed a chiropractor. That's a long story, right? And I didn't know about checks then that you couldn't cash them at the bank. It's always a story. Yeah, and they got the license plate from behind, and then they came and got me at uh, Boulevard Hardware. And that was my first real legitimate pinch. They put us at the tombs, and the tombs is like just scary as shit. Now, this kid, Mark D'Onofrio, no Mark D'Onofrio. Mark D'Onofrio was a middle linebacker for Penn State. But Mark D'Onofrio had problems. Like he was, when he was a kid, his brother would tie him onto a bike and put him down a hill. You know what I'm saying? Like we tortured this kid. Like he was the young kid on the block. Right. And we'd go to his house and tie him up and make him eat raw eggs and shit. And all of a sudden this kid grew up to be six foot six, 260. And he had So issues. every time I'm around him, I always pray to God he don't remember when I made him eat dog shit. And, you know, we used, to, we used to do some crazy shit. You know, right. it was a group of guys, you know. Yeah. And uh, we went to this tombs. <laughs> we went to this tombs thing. Listen, in this room, it was more people than like the 1040 Club. It was like a bar on a Saturday night. Everybody who gets arrested, everybody's in their suits, everybody smells of cologne. But to top it off, there was a thousand black crackheads in this motherfucker. I mean, heavy duty crackheads that are looking at your sneakers and shit. This is real. And there was maybe, and I'm exaggerating, there was maybe 200 people in this holding pen. 
and four chairs. Oh, really? <laughs> four chairs, okay? We walk in. Mark D'Onofrio walks up to the, one of the guys that's sitting, picks up the chair, and throws him off. That's, that was my induction. Yeah. Like, I lost every bodily fluid in me. He walked in. Like, as soon as they locked the fucking thing, he walked in, looked at where, who had the chairs, walked up to the first fucking guy with a chair, and threw him off the fucking chair and said, this chair is mine, motherfucker. And I don't have to tell you, you better get up for my buddy. I mean, this was on. And, this and I'm like, oh, fucking no. <laughs> Oh no, he didn't. You didn't and pee yourself or anything. Did I you? almost did. Really? And he was and he was using fucking racial epithets and everything. Oh really? No, he don't give a fuck. This yeah. guy's a professional football player that brings it. Right. That fucking brings it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it was that was the scariest weekend I wow. ever had in my life. But just to, to tell you, you know, this is only for a couple of months. I hung out with this older kid, and when this kid was younger, this Mark Denafri and Mark and his older brother was a sultan. Because they always put a towel around his head, so he called him the Sultan of Swing. <laughs> so we used to go to these houses and rob beer cases. We used to rob beer trucks uh -huh. in high school. A right. uh, beer truck pulls up to a liquor store, and then you get a car, and you hold somebody by the back of the pants, and they pull up to the trunk, and they slide the door open, and then you take the beer right off the thing. And we would take beer trucks. We would rob beer trucks and then take the beers to somebody's house, put them in the tub, and put ice on them, and drink beers, and play uh Quarters and all that right. shit, and we used to go play to quarters. Yeah, whatever the fuck you play, you know. <laughs> Rob a I remember one time we, we robbed a case of warm quarts. You could never heat cold up a fucking quart in time. We were drinking warm quarts of beer. Mm. It was horrible. We used to go to this kid's house, John, all of us, and he used to do crazy shit. And his father was a cop. So one day, John, I mean, every fucking at the the party always ended with a calamity. And one day, John, like one party, John would come with his father's revolver and play Russian roulette. This is after fucking Deer Hunter. He's done, and he would put like three bullets in. Fuck it, let's play <laughs> Russian roulette. Time to go. Another time, his mother had a chill. Well, I'll never forget this, bro. I talked about this. His mother had a French poodle, and it didn't have a yard. They had like a little uh, sliding door that you open, the poodle would go out. Right. In that yard, there was a million little shits, French poodle shits. <laughs> I mean, thousands of them. Like, he would just come out and drop these little right. two-inch shits and drop yeah, them. If you gather them all up, it would be a family pack. <coughs> they would Cheetos. just yeah, scrape yeah, them into yeah. the wall. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. They would come out once a week with a shovel and just push the little French poodle shit uh, into the wall. Uh. So we couldn't smoke <laughs> pot in his house, right? We couldn't smoke <laughs> pot in his house. I'll never forget this. We couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't smoke pot in his house. So we go out into the balcony. <laughs> into the balcony. So one time we're out there smoking. It's 10 below zero. Those little shits are frozen to death. He's scratching his head looking at one. And all of a sudden he goes, pass the hat around. He goes, I, how much you guys pay me to eat a piece of shit? <laughs> <laughs> so we passed the hat around. This guy ate a piece of shit. It looked like a... Uh, uh, a <laughs> not a Milky Way, a baby root. It had a little lumps in his <laughs> shit. Root. It looked like a little Halloween baby root that came out a little asshole, right? And I'll never forget, we passed the hat around. He got like $4, right? He took this piece of shit and he bit it and he was chewing it for like 10 minutes. Like, oh, that's so like, gross. <laughs> then he popped the other one in his mouth like it was nothing. I'll never forget <laughs> witnessing that. After that, like we wouldn't even smoke pot with him no more. Like, dog, you got to bring your own pot. Dog. <laughs> it's yeah. so fucking gross. <clears throat> and if he would have waited, he could have gone on Fear Factor and made big money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 30 years when he had to wait. All he would have done was gone on there and ate a piece of dog shit. They right. would have gave him 50 grand just off of principle. So, Joey, would you eat a scorpion or a French poodle poop? <laughs> never, never. I bit a head off a mouse one time at a Halloween party. You one did? Year. Yes, I did. You did? I won first prize. I went as garbage to a fucking... Me and my buddies went to a costume <laughs> party as garbage. garbage. <laughs> Fuck yeah. And we put a garbage trunk on. We went to Kmart. We cut the bottom off the trunk and we put it on with suspenders. Mm -hmm. And then I took, we went to a pet shop and we got live mice and we tied fucking strings to them and put them on the top of a garbage can hat. Like, I had a garbage can but lid. But they were alive? They're alive. And, oh I had, <laughs> and I had a garbage can, and I had a brown bag, and I took the brown bag, rolled it up, and I crazy glued the fucking uh, garbage can container to the hat. So it looked like I looked like Oscar. Right. But the, I went to the party with the fucking tails tied on little strings to the thing. And after I had a couple bumps of me and a couple cocktails, my buddy started eating the mice. I said, might as well give me one, too. And I'll never forget my buddy was eating the mouse. And after it was all over, he had the mouse's tail stuck to his lip like a little tail with blood on it and shit. Oh, <laughs> oh fuck God. yeah. Really? I had fun growing up. I had fun. I told you guys. I had fun. But that, oh my God, John. that John story when he ate the little piece of dog shit and it was frozen that had been mummified. <laughs> oh, 
Let's take a breather. If you have any interesting stories that you ate growing up, email us at <laughs> Beauty and the Beast Podcast at gmail.com. Oh my God, Joey, that's terrible. He gave a little piece of dog shit. That was the highlight of my life. Look at my eyes. I still I think know, about I, it and laugh. <laughs> Because as a kid, looking at it like you're interested, but at the same time, you're like, this is fucking disgusting. That is so disgusting. You know, he's never drinking out of my soda again. <laughs> <laughs> Did he eat all four of those turds? Or? He ate like a handful of them. He just <laughs> kept, he had like 10 of them in his hand, like M&M's, and he just kept biting them. <laughs> oh, no, <shut> up. <laughs> Did he like swallow them whole, or he'd like, you know? Bro, he would pop them in his mouth, you know, like a fucking malt ball. He'd throw it up in the air. <laughs> But when he bit the first one, he showed us the inside. He was chewing on it. Like, <laughs> we'll be right back, guys. Thank you. That is so gross. We have a guest. Yes, we do. This is a guy that, uh, first of all, let me tell you what's going on. We, we try to play around with so many things here on Beauty and the Beast podcast, you know, from stories to, to little interviews. We wanted to throw in, like, a movie segment. But this isn't your typical uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, two little fat fucks talking about movies that don't know what the fuck is going on. I brought in somebody who, I'll tell you what, I thought I was a movie buff till I met him. Uh, this time as I get into conversation with him, I have to fucking hang up the phone because he knows so much about this stuff. But I'm not talking about these faggy movies that come out today. I'm not talking about this shit. And we do get some good ones that come out. I'm talking about old school movies from, I mean, he knows everything about everything. You know, I pick up like in the 60s with my type of movies, but uh, it's really an honor to have him on. He's one of my best friends. We did Payaso Slam together. Let's give him some love, Mr. Rick Ramos. Woo! Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Joey, Felicia. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate uh, it. We got an email like we always do. This show is run by emails pretty yeah. much and our crazy fucking stories. And we got an email from somebody that, you know, complimented myself and Felicia. He liked the podcast. Then we wrote him back. Then he wrote back. He was a Jersey guy, and he wrote back that he wanted to know if there was any movies or books that have mm -hmm. changed our lives. And it's really funny because, you know, for some people, some people watch a movie, and it takes them away for two hours. You know, some people yeah. could watch. Some people, you know, sometimes I sit here and criticize. I, I read, so, oh, I went to see Paranormal Activity, and it sucked. You couldn't fucking tell from the commercial that it was going <laughs> to suck. But who the fuck yeah. am I? You yeah. know, maybe that was your escape. Mm -hmm. I don't have that type of escape. I escaped with marijuana, and for years I escaped with drugs. Uh, but one escape I do have is movies. I've learned a lot from movies, especially yeah. not learning, not knowing English when you come to this country. I learned how to speak English from Dick Van Dyke and shit like yeah. that. But there's little things in movies that have fucking changed our lives. Well, that's the thing about movies is that it, movies distills, distill life down to its core essentials. And, you know, it's a, it, you, have a, you have 90 minutes to two hours to get the story out there. You don't have time for the bullshit. You don't have, to t have time for the mundane. But that's the thing. You know, you're watching a movie and you see, I don't care who you are. I don't care if, what kind of job that you have or how cool you think you are. When you're watching a movie and it's a great movie and that character is up there kicking the shit out of it, you're imagining yourself as him. That's what I do every time. I don't know how many times I've been watching a movie where I think, that's the guy. I was telling my friend Mike Black, another comic, I was telling my friend Mike Black, another comic, we went to go see The, the Untouchables. They were, re they were playing it in town. I was like, I remember being a kid. I remember being a kid in my living room pretending I got shot like Sean Connery and then crawling through the house. Remember that scene where yeah. he's just he's covered in bullet <laughs> holes? I'm like, I'm a, I'm a fucking kid and I'm imagining being shot up crawling through the kitchen. And my mom would my mom would walk in every once in a while and she's like, what the hell are you doing? I was like, I'm, I'm Sean Connery right now. That's the thing, you know? Don't fuck with the game right now. I'm playing. I'm having a good time. I'm imagining. That's the thing. That's the power of movies because it takes you to another place. It makes you a better person, man. This guy has a great question because it's about people have different things in their lives that take them to different places and make it worthwhile I know I've read a couple of books a couple of songs and a few movies you know that have that that make it better everybody I don't care I feel sorry for anybody who doesn't have a movie like that I really do and what is what is your movie what is your your ultimate movie you know what it's not the best movie ever made but it's my <coughs> favorite movie of all time. It's Midnight Run. It's a 1988 film directed by Martin Brest with De Niro, Charles really? Grodin, yeah, really? Yafet Koto, Dennis Farina. It's been on every fucking night this week. Yeah. And every <coughs> night this week, I stop and watch it. I still remember seeing that movie in yeah. the movie theaters. 
And you know, for me, that movie isn't as strong as it is for you. Mm -hmm. I, I fucking watch that movie and I still laugh. You know, I'm uh, I, 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 I'm scared of heights. Yeah, no, I do this. No. I suffer from this. Do you suffer from fistophobia? <laughs> you know, just so, so many little lines. You know, a a scumbag. My name is Vinny. Vinny. <laughs> you know, all those little fucking things with that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but Dennis Farina destroys it. But you got a better story. You know what's me. crazy about that? That guy that says, uh, "Say scumbag, I'm Vinny." You yeah. know who that guy is? Joe Pesci. No, no, no. That's Frank Pesci. Joe. Frank Pesci. Frank. That's the guy that wrote, wrote 29th, 29th Street. Street. Boom, yes, it is. You know, he wrote 29th Street. Yeah, he had a, he had a nice that? little bit. 29th Street is a fucking movie that is like a New York movie that's hysterical. It's a, it's Danny Aiello and the guy Anthony from Lampaglia. Anthony Lampaglia. Oh, I like Anthony yeah. Lampaglia. When he first came from, oh. and Paulie Walnuts, oh, well, Vinnie Curto that I met at the comedy store. He's a boxer from Italy. He was in a Miami Vice. Mm -hmm. It just has so many neighborhood guys, but this guy took his neighborhood and broke it down just a little better than. Uh, you know, what's his name in, uh, in the De Niro Mark's film? Tale. He broke yeah. it down. You know, he had about Frank the Nap, who was a, right. a, a epileptic and would fall asleep. And, <laughs> and Danny Aiello, you know, is a fucking kind of a joke to me, but I like him. I respect him and mm -hmm. do the right thing. He was great. Yeah. But in 29th Street, he steals the show. I'm not a fucking loser. He steals the show. Oh, First wow. time I seen that movie, I cried for a week. I've yeah. never seen it. Oh, that my God. I gotta, I gotta watch it's it. about a lottery ticket. It's Actually, about a lottery yeah. ticket. It's, it's directed by the guy who wrote Midnight Run. No that's shit. That's George, oh, really? yeah, George Gallo. Gallo, yes, 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 directed George by George Gallo. 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 Wow. Right, 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 right. He wrote Midnight Run, so. Yes, you know, it is. That's, that's a great film, man. That's that guy, you know? It's like, it goes back, for me, it goes back to Midnight Run. Midnight Run was one of these movies, you know, when you, when you watch a movie, I remember seeing the previews for it and thinking, okay, I'm interested in this, but I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. I remember renting it on, on VHS tape, you know, with like a two hour, five minute, I just put it in, and I'm watching it in my room, and I'm doing other things, and before I know it, it's over. And I think, wait a minute, what, what the fuck did I just see? I saw something that was great. I immediately rewound it and watched it with no interruptions. I locked the door, I turned the lights off, I just watched, and I was fixated because that character made sense to me. This is a guy who's hardcore, you know, just a man who would not bend. And it was like, I was watching something that I related to, and I couldn't figure out what it was that I related to. That was 1988 when I saw that movie. It was 2003 when I think De Niro did Meet the Fockers. Right. And he had this really short haircut. And I'm looking at this movie and I'm like, Jesus Christ. I called my mom. I was like, Mom, put on Meet the Fockers. Who does he look like? And she was like, Jesus, it looks like your old man. And I was like, he, he looks just like my dad. He looks just like my dad. And that's when I realized Midnight Run, 15, 16, 17 years later, that was the connection. Watching my dad on screen, that hard-ass guy. You know, my dad is a prick, but he's a good man. He's a hard-working, honest, um, you know, a man with, with a lot of honor. And that's what the De Niro character was. That's what Jack Walsh is. I mean, you're looking at a guy who was a Chicago cop working undercover trying to bring down this scumbag drug dealer. And what happens? His guys turn on him. They plant heroin on him. He has a choice. Go to prison for, you know, for the rest of his life. Go on the payroll or just walk. And he walks. You know, but he's losing everything. He loses his wife. He loses his kid. He loses his honor. Everything, and he's doing a shit job that he can't stand. That's like, you know, my old man worked for the post office for forty years. You know, he's a miserable bastard. I'm looking at the same thing, and it's like that was the connection. That was that was the thing where you see, you see somebody who who believes in the job that they're doing, whether or not they could they can make a big score or a little score or just get by, you know, he's not going to bend. And that's what I always saw with my old man. That's why I'm as fucked up as I am right now with, with relationships, with, with work, with everything, is because of that identification. Midnight Run put it down like no other film I had ever seen up to that point. I mean, I was only 14, 15 years old at the time, but it was, it was the start of, of like... It was the start of identifying what it was that I loved about movies. You know, before that, I would just watch a movie and have a good time. After that, I started really understanding what movies were about. And every movie subsequently, I could either dismiss as just either a good time or a shit movie or something that was overpowering, unforgiven with Eastwood, the wild bunch with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, William Holden and Ernest Borgnine, where you saw these were movies that really had... These were movies that really had a soul and a heart and were trying to say something. And fucking Death Wish. Death Wish. You know, yeah. fucking Death Wish. I just watched Death Hunt the other day and I'm yeah. watching this dumb movie and it's about a guy who they shoot a fucking dog that yeah. don't belong to him. Exactly. And he fucking loses his mind. 
He yeah. shoots the whole town. You know he, what I'm saying? He kills Charlie everybody. Charlie Rat. No. <laughs> <laughs> he shoots everybody. He does. Charles Bronson. And that's why we always love Charles Bronson. We mm -hmm. all, me, I like guys. I don't like bad guys necessarily. Mm -hmm. I like guys that stick up for something. Exactly. They believe in something. Mm -hmm. And they risk everything they fucking have in the world. Mm -hmm. To fucking make that happen, you know what I'm saying? They, they don't, don't give a fuck. It's there's not no about safety right or there. wrong. It's not. About, I respect no. that so much. You know, there's movies. How many movies have you got to see? You didn't want. It? When I was a kid, mm -hmm. every girl I fucked always liked Richard Gere. Yeah. I wanted to take Richard Gere and beat the living fuck out of him. Yeah. You understand me? <laughs> I seen him out of the club one night, like in Xenons, mm -hmm. like in '83. He had all white hair, and I'm like, this old ratty motherfucker. I should go with that <laughs> bitch slap him. <laughs> Right, like. But oh. you didn't, did you? No, because he had a bodyguard <laughs> and three other things. But well, that bodyguard, boom, smacked. So you know, it's really weird. I'm looking at this motherfucker, and I remember that I would refuse to see the American Jiggle. Mm -hmm. I refused to see that fucking movie, and I refused to see F Office and the Scumbag. Yeah. I refused to see that movie. And then one day I was in Harlem. I got a nickel bag, and I had three hours to kill. And for two dollars, you go see two movies. Yeah. And it was midnight. I was uh, uh, American Jiggle. American, uh, and, uh, American Office Jiggle and, and Office and the Scumbag. Yeah. And I remember sitting there. And I learned so much in that movie when he's like, yeah, you sharpened up, but you're still the same person. Mm -hmm. Like when he when he tells his dad he's going to join the service and his dad's like, look at you. You're not a fucking Air Force pilot. Oh, you yeah. know, in today's world, you have to tell your kids, oh, my God, these are real guys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Spanish guy, Frank Lopez, played him. The mm -hmm. father. He played uh, Richard Gere's father, an officer and a gentleman. Jesus, you know, he, he, who played Frank Lopez in Scarface? Oh, Robert Loggia. Roger Loggia played Logia, his father. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, I'm going to go join the, uh, the airport or whatever the Air Force. He's like, fucking look at you. Mm -hmm. You ain't no fucking soldier. And he hits the mirror. That's a great scene. That was my stepdad. Like, you ain't fucking ready for this shit. So is that the movie that uh, changed your no, life? No, the movie that changed my life, me and Rick were talking about it, it didn't change my life. Was 19, and here's the weird thing it was 1981 when mm -hmm. I really got, like, I always was a movie freak. Yeah. You know, I had the Godfather who would take me to the movies and put a gun in my hand when I go see Great Dirty Harry and shit. But no movie moved me more than uh, November or October of 81. I had stolen HBO. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the guy next to me delivered cable, so I had him hit me with HBO and all the dirty channels. <laughs> we had the old box. He charged everybody 200 for life to get yeah. free HBO. <laughs> I got it on the yard. For own. life. Everybody for life. Got, everybody 200, everybody in the neighborhood had HBO <laughs> and a box. And I remember that the, the month that changed my life of movies was it would come on every night because HBO wasn't big then. It yeah. just had like 10 movies. But every night it was the same lineup. Hollywood Nights, which is oh, brilliant. With New Bomb Turk. With New yeah, Bomb yeah, motherfucking Turk. Turk. <laughs> From there, Raging Bull, mm -hmm. another brilliant. And it would yeah. end up the night with Thief. And yeah, I, yeah. I never wanted to watch Thief. What movie it's is that? Thief. James Caan. Michael Kahn, Mann film. Michael Mann, one of Michael Mann's early films I out of Chicago. Really? First directing film. First yeah. directing job yeah. out of Chicago. Yeah. Dennis Farina has one scene in it. Uh, William Patterson from CSI, mm -hmm. one scene. All these guys got one who's scene. The, who's the, the Godfather thing? Robert Prost. Robert Prost. Robert Prost. Fucking Prost. tremendous oh, from man. Hill Street Jews. Oh, that's fucking, fucking tremendous. Oh. Tremendous. You understand me? <laughs> Right? And he tells him he's like, I'm gonna send, I'm gonna send ten niggers to fuck, fuck your wife well. up the oh, ass. Oh, shit. oh Are you tremendous! I'll have your wife on the street getting fucked in the ass by when niggers and boys. Oh, oh. You work for me, you <laughs> lousy motherfucker. Till you die, you're burnt out or you're in the can. It's a great movie, but that is a scary old. If man you watch movie. the movie now, you're like Joey. It's a fucking snore fest. But here's what I learned at 18 years old from that movie. There's a scene where he goes to visit Willie Nelson in prison. How fucking strong is that? Willie Nelson in prison. <laughs> he was the master thief. Mm -hmm. Willie, is, Nelson was. Willie, Willie Nelson was. Willie Nelson was the wow. master wow. thief. The only weak link in that movie is Jimmy Belushi. Oh. He's remember Jim Belushi yeah. was the assistant. Tuesday Well was a hundred and still looked good. Yeah. I'd still eat her fucking little monkey. She was a hundred. <laughs> She didn't look like the way she did the Cincinnati kid. No, oh. She wasn't the same redhead from the Cincinnati kid. But that she, wasn't, still she wasn't the animal. She wasn't once upon no, a time in America. But she was supposed either, to be but, beat yeah. up. She mm -hmm. was supposed to be beat up. They're in the diner, and mm -hmm. he's, he's working her over. He says two lines in the movie that have always stayed with me. And when I meet somebody, I judge him up by this line. He says, you're waiting for a bus that wish never comes because you don't want to fucking get on it anyway. Wow. He tells Tuesday while well, at the diner. And then he tells, then he's visiting, and I'm going to cry. He tells Willie Nelson to jail. He goes, Willie Nelson says to him, so how's your wife? <clears throat> and he goes, and, this, and everybody write this fucking line down and you live by this because this line will make you or break you. Yeah. He tells Willie Nelson, my wife left me. While I was out doing scores, she thought I was spending time with fancy women. And he goes, I got a new woman now. Her name is Jessie. He goes, so do I tell her I'm laying scores? And without a breath, Willie Nelson looks at him through the fucking glass 
And he goes, lie to no one. Who the fuck are they? You got to lie to them. And if, and if they turn out to be good friends, you're going to hurt them with a lie. That line, stay That's with awesome. me yeah. forever. Lie to no one. Who the fuck are they yeah. you got to lie to them for? And what happens if they do become tight? Now you're going to fuck it up with a lie. Yeah. And he, his face melts. And that's before he goes, tell me what you... Remember, they're talking yeah. back and forth, and finally you hear a bell. That means you got to come up, and fucking James Conn goes right up to the glass, and he goes, tell me what you need. And he goes real close, and he fogs up the glass, and he goes, get me out of here. Fucking classic. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking classic. You understand me? You know? So I understand those lines. What movie changed you like that? One line. Oh, God. Let me think One that. fucking line that changed your life from a fucking movie. Think about that. <laughs> One thing, one line that changed it for me was Clint Eastwood has just come back into the city of the, the, the little town of Big Whiskey. He's just shot up the entire bar. He <laughs> shot Skinny. That man should have armed himself. <laughs> if he was going to decorate it, that was great. But <coughs> Gene Hackman, he's gut, he's gut shot. He's on the ground dying. And Gene Hackman looks up at, at, at Clint and he's just like, I don't deserve to die like this. I was building a house. I don't deserve this. And Eastwood just looks at him and goes, Deserves got nothing to do with it. Boom. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, if this isn't right, this isn't wrong, this is what we do. And you got to know that. And that's what I loved about that moment. That moment was perfect. I remember watching it just thinking, that's what life is about. It's not about that. Deserves got shit to do with it, man. Not about this the hangover right. or no, 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 Inglorious no. Bastards and all that goofy this shit. Is, this is a man. Fucking, this is rock and roll movies, dog. Do. Yeah. This is another movie that has destroyed me. It has destroyed me. It, it set me on a path since 2004. It has made me a new man because it really made me believe that somebody wrote this and there's people out there and it's a man called, it's a movie called Man on Fire with Denzel oh, yeah. Washington. That's the best movie. Oh, to, yeah, yeah. That's the best movie that to come out the movie. last 10 yeah. years. Easy! If you read what the fuck is going on, that's the best movie. If you could take Avatar and shove it up your mother's ass, fucking the other one, and Glorious Bastards. You put on Man on Fucking Fire, and you check back with me. When he walks into that little Mexican's apartment, yeah. and the dude says to him, usually in the church, you know, God punishes people. And he looks at him, Denzel, without missing a beat, and he goes, I leave that up to God. I'm just here to set up the meeting. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> That's a great line. He has a couple lines in that movie. Oh, what, what? he has a couple like that you just sit there and go, are you fucking kidding me? He was on a mission. There are moments in a movie. That's what people don't understand. It's like when a movie, when a movie has those moments, when it has that thing that it draws you in. Like the scene in Midnight Run at the end, De Niro hasn't seen Dennis Farina. He hasn't seen Jimmy Serrano in nine years. This guy has taken his wife, his job, his daughter, his whole self worth, his whole his whole reason, his whole purpose in life was to be a cop. And Farina has taken that from him. And he's just standing there in front of me, like, you know what? Now we got a little bit of time to spend together. I, it's something I've been wanting to ask you. How, How does it feel? feel to have a cop or fucking your wife. <laughs> oh my wow. god! At and the airport. Him, yeah. yeah. And he looks like him. You know they made this guy a captain. They made him a captain. Can you fucking can you believe, believe that? that? Yeah. Can you fucking believe and that? And De Niro. That that's what Tommy was like. Because sometimes when you when you see acting or when you're when you're acting and you're like, I got no lines. What am I gonna do? To watch De Niro just take that beating, that verbal beating, that emotional beating, and smoke the cigarette. I mean, that's the best acting that I've ever seen. Because he was could, he could have he could have killed him right there. But that's how much Farina owned him at that moment. And I love that scene. That's, that's the whole scene. Listen, guys, before we movie. even leave here, I got to tell you something. Yeah. There's a, th a million movies made every year. Yeah. If you go on YouTube right now, press in Jimmy Serrano. Mm -hmm. Just a character from a movie. J-I-M-M-Y Serrano. C-E-R-R-A-N-L or whatever the fuck it is. Somebody took the time to make a reel of him just in that movie. My idol when it comes to mobs is, oh, really? is oh, yeah. Dennis oh, yeah. Farina. You got to remember, Dennis Farina was a fucking cop who was working a detail on Thief. Mm -hmm. And they were having a problem with shooting. And Michael Mann said, hey, you're a cop. Come in here. You know, teach us. And the next oh, thing you know, really? he was a fucking that. actor. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? And that was his next movie after mm -hmm. that. And his lines in that movie... You know, uh, Murray, relax. Mm -hmm. Go drink a drink cream soda. <laughs> All those little fucking lines. Like yeah. Do some fucking thing. Do some yeah. fucking thing. Have a soda. Have mm -hmm. a. What's another one? Stop. Say one more word. I'll bury this fucking okay. phone in your skull. I mean, he had. I'm gonna go down there and blow torch the both of you. He favorite, just had so many great lines in that. My favorite line is like, like the Duke. 
I'm finally in the presence of greatness. The man who steals money from the scum of the earth and gives it to the unfortunate of the world. And he smacks him. And he just smacks, smacks him. Smacks him in the face like a fucking He's bitch. Like, I wanted you to know something. You're going to die tonight. <laughs> You're going to go home. I'm going to have a nice hot meal. I'm going to find your wife, and I'm going to kill her, too. That's what he tells him. Oh, yeah. Smack right in the smacks face. Smacks him in the face with an open hand, which is the worst thing in the fucking oh, yeah. world. Yeah. That's why Jeff Valdez ran out of there. <laughs> <laughs> a smack to the face is a motherfucker. When you got five fingers left on your face and you try to write an affidavit to the cops it's and like you feel those and face. those fingers oh. are still stinging on your face, a smack to the trust me, bro. Oh, that was a crazy night. That's my weapon of choice, the bit slap to the fucking upper <laughs> jaw, and you just sit there mummified, thinking about where the fuck you went wrong, you know. That's right. Yeah. But I'm happy I had you here today. We've been trying to get you for a couple been, weeks. You know what? I want to do it. To I break down, do but you know, I know yeah. you have other obligations Please. and stuff. Please come uh, back. And uh, let's talk more about movies. I feel like I'm in a testosterone fest. Like no, I this is this is I and mean, this is not. You know, I don't want the people home to say, "Well, you guys are like The Godfather." We both enjoy The we Godfather, but I'm the type of guy I will cry when I watch, I watch The Godfather. Oh, it's okay. a family movie for me. Mm -hmm. I cry that scene where fucking he tells him he goes, huh, if "That's your brother. How come he's got a different name?" Yeah, that was me. He goes because when Sonny was a kid, he was playing on the street one day and brought him home. And he became our fucking fan. Who brings you the fuck home? Who brings you home? Aww. No paperwork, no nothing. Yeah. Let's go, bro. You're going to come live with me. It's the oh, oh, my God. Oh, that, that's well, amazing. I, I love when that happens. That's, that's fucking that's amazing line. That's Are you happening. fucking kidding me? That's what I feel. I feel sorry for people yeah. who don't have that understanding of movies. So just, let's just go see this movie. Listen, you want to really cry? Yeah. The best line of the Godfather is when he goes to the fucking hospital to go see his father. Mm -hmm. And the baker shows up. Because that's me and him. Me and him are the baker. That's my character. Yeah. When he shows, there's nobody at the hospital, not a soul. And yeah. the kid shows up and he says, "Can you do me a favor?" And he goes, "He goes, I'm here for your father, mm -hmm. for your father." And the guy's like, "Okay, throw this away." Look like a gangster. And he rolls up Pretend and he's he smoking a, a cigarette. And when the cops pull away, his fucking hand is trembling. But he stood his ground. This is what this movie's about. Yeah. It's not about the guy who was a baker. He was there for this guy who did him a favor. This guy got him into the country 10 years. He had, he had no conversation with Enzo, the fucking baker. One time he met Enzo. Out of all the people in his life, Enzo showed up at the fucking hospital. And he goes, you want to help me? Help me move my father. When the gangster showed, the cops showed, after the whole scene was blown up, the kid couldn't even hold the cigarette in his hands. He didn't run. He didn't do anything. He fucking stood his ground. That's life. Like we just did a, another podcast, and we oh, yeah. talked about the women. Yeah, we did a second. This is the chick that does the podcast. Never. Let's do a thing on hot fucking bitches, and we picked Ali McGraw, who Man. took a beating oh, yeah. from fucking Steve McQueen in the Getaway, mm -hmm. and took it like a fucking woman. Not one that she dialed nine one one. Nothing. <laughs> she took the beating against the phone. And I sucked his face. dick. <laughs> Fuck it. Give me the fucking beating. Well, what would it. you have done? What oh, would you have yeah. done? I want to call 911. What did you send me there for? No, yeah. they, you have the, no woman well, would call the cops no on Steve McQueen. Well, there was no 911. That's the so fuck. Well. No woman had the balls to call the cops on Steve McQueen. Not on Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen punches you in the kidney. You take it like a woman. <laughs> you just fucking put some Band-Aid on it, get some cum and rub it on it, and you're back. The Steve fuck? And what was the other Steve woman? Oh, Madeline Kahn. Madeline Kahn and fucking oh. Young Frankenstein. Yeah. Oh, really? That's how me and Rick roll. We give everybody it. credit here. Because women make the fucking movies and nobody gives them enough credit. Right, right away they want to give some movie that's something fucking outlandish. Hey, when a woman steals a movie, she steals a fucking movie. That's it, man. It was another great week of podcast, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? From right. eating shit and learning about movies and talking about all crazy stuff. And yeah. And uh, once again, you guys, if you want to email us, please email us at beautyandthebeastpodcast at gmail.com. Email us your stories. If you want to email us even a video of you telling your story, please do that. If you want to uh, uh, email us any artwork of Beauty and the Beast, we would love that. We put it up on the website. Fuck and yeah. uh, and uh, like uh, I'm going to use someone sent us a link to their music. I'm going to use some of that music. Thank you so much for listening. And also, uh, for myself and Felicia, this last week, we finally got on iTunes Top 200. Yes, and number we 67. Thank, and we want to thank you motherfuckers yes. for listening and for your comments and for your love and everything because without you, we would have nothing. We wouldn't even be here. All right? And let's also remember who our sponsors are. That's right, adamandeve.com, you sexy motherfuckers. I know. If you guys want to make your ladies happy, go to Adam and Eve, order up a bunch of stuff, go into the promotional code. If you put in the word Felicia... F-E-L-I-C-I-A. You'll get 50% off. You'll get free shipping. You'll get three videos. You'll get a sensual gift and our eternal love.
That's right. So have a great week and stay black. Love you.